everyone. Thanks for joining us here on Nerd Talk with Jake and John. I am Jake. I'm John. This is Nerd Talk with Jake and John. And joining us again for another review of the book of Boba Fett is our friend, the Jay Simmons. How you doing, Jay? Hi, guys. I'm great. Remember, this to go forward, this to stop. <laughs> I really thought you were doing the stick thing for a minute. I was like, <laughs> I mean, it works. It's the same episode. And, and, and a shout out to my family. They, uh, they, 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 we've had, had quite, the, uh, quite the experience this week with no power for more than 48 hours at home. It's uh, finally warmed up a little bit in the house. Uh, and the first thing that my wife wanted to do was to watch Book of Boba Fett just in case the power went off again so that we'd have a chance to do this recording tonight. So, yay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to dive in um, with our overview thoughts first that are non-spoiler. And I'll apologize ahead of time uh, because I think I just dived into this without realizing it. So what I'm going to do is bounce around and get the over non-spoiler thoughts of this episode from both of our guys. And then we'll jump into the spoiler thoughts. So if you haven't seen it, I'm going to give you a warning before that for you to hit pause, go watch it, and come back and get our thoughts on the remainder of the episode. So we'll go ahead and jump to John first. John, what are your non-spoiler thoughts on episode two, Tribes of Tatooine? Uh, I, th I thought it was, um, it, it could have worked as the first episode. Uh, I'm almost sorry that they didn't switch the order. Um, that being said, by the same token, I really enjoyed having a chance to get kind of an overview of everything, get a get a really good past, present, you know, little layout for the first episode, and then dive into this. And boy, this is this was an episode um, that if you are a fan of Star Wars, if you have been a fan of Star Wars for years, this um, answers questions, fills things in, and was very satisfying. All right. Jay, what's your thoughts? Um, I, I don't know how this worked, but they must have listened to us last week, gone back in time, <laughs> because if you go and listen to last week's review, many of the things that we commented on, both mechanically from a way of storytelling, from storytelling craft, and the bloody link of the episode, <laughs> for crying out loud, all of those things got, the marks were hit, and it was really satisfying. Um, and it was a really solid story and much more so than last week it was basically a singular story um and i i actually found that i preferred that i think well i, I was expecting something different after what happened last week on the episode mm -hmm. um but i found it really rewarding the way they chose to tell this episode differently so I agree uh, and and as... is it a spoiler if I bring up trains? Like, how is that a thing? <laughs> it is not. Space trains, space trains, Firefly, Solo, and now Boba Fett. Yeah. And uh, Spider-Man. Yes. Like, <laughs> you almost got me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say my non-spoiler thoughts on this episode I very much enjoyed it. There were a lot of special effects that I very much enjoyed. I'm going to speak about those uh, down the line. Um, I will also say that I did know that the Huts employ all the competitors from the Mystery Universe competition. Because <laughs> there's no other way that shot took place. Um, uh, the other thought I have spoiler. is, oh, as a, if you can get a spoiler from that, please feel free to dislike this video. <laughs> go ahead and, and, bear, and go ahead and justify that. Um, the other thing that I very much liked about this video is it's kind of minor, but it is the coolest representation I've seen of one of my favorite species in Star Wars, and we'll talk about that here in a bit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, overall, great episode, great follow up to the opener. Um, so, if we are ready, we're going to dive in with spoilers to Tribes of Tatooine, Episode Two of the Book of Boba Fett on Disney+. Plus. So if you have not watched, this is your last warning. Get out or stay. That's up to you, but it's on you. You have been warned. You have been warned. All right, so episode two, The Tribes of Tatooine is directed by Steph Green and written by John Favreau with Noah Clore as a staff writer with writing credit to George Lucas as well. Section one of this episode opens with Fennec, 
uh, bringing back the assassin from the previous episode, walking up to Java's palace. The doors open, very reminiscent of Return of the Jedi. This entire sequence actually uh, is very, very Return of the Jedi. Um, brings him into the palace, enters, stands in the audience chamber with Boba, um, 8D8, Fennec, and the pig people. Uh, has a little bit of back and forth. Guy really refuses to answer questions, curses him in hot ease. Fennec taunts him by saying, well, maybe we'll just feed you to the Rancor. Drops him through the trap door we all know is there. Um, guy kind of freaks out for a minute after being in the Rancor pit. Says the mayor sent him. Fennec says, it's empty, Assassin of the Nightwind. Turns to Boba and says, shall we visit the mayor? This um, contains scene. Let's uh, go first with Jay. What are your thoughts on this scene? Uh, it, I... As a li- truly an actuality lifelong Star Wars fan and viewer, the the moment we had that establishing shot near the palace with Fennec and the assassin, uh, which is kind of funny since she's the Disney assassin princess, um, that uh, I just, yes, I was taken immediately back to Jedi and I couldn't help but just really appreciate that I don't want to quite call it fan service, <clears throat> um, but it certainly was meant for for those of us that have been with Star Wars for a long time. And I, I, I was waiting for, there's not really a rancor there anymore between Boba Fett and what happened in Jedi. Between those two things, I was pretty sure we were going to have an empty rancor pit. Um, so I was amused to know it. I, I really enjoyed the sequence. I thought it worked. Very happy. Not, not to mention that little rat that shows up right at the end <laughs> was just... Was it Are you afraid of me? Name? Wasn't the Rancor's name like... It was uh, something goofy. It was like fluffy or something ridiculous. It's, it is something ridiculous because we found out in Bad Batch season one. Maybe it was Princess. Is it Princess? I don't remember. I feel... I feel like I might have to turn in one of my cards. So you should look it up and put it in the in the Uh, description. John, what are your thoughts on the uh, on that on that first section? That that first section was, I mean, it 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 pushed the story along, gave us something visually interesting with the surroundings going back into the same. You know, it it, they really established where they're where they're going to be here. the uh, um, seeing the inside of Jabba's palace, well, seeing the, the 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 grand door of Jabba's palace opening and and closing, and then bringing them in, and then hey, <laughs> why don't you go to the Rancor and wham, drops him down. I mean it, everything. Uh, he he looked over at the at the door inside the Rancor pit, and it's. I mean, it's it's spot on perfect to the one that Luke tries to go up to and get into, and then again the the little mouse or rat kind of kind of looking at him and and almost almost uh, uh, teasing him for ha, 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 you thought I was going to be something fierce. <laughs> um, Rancor's name was Moochie. Thank you, <laughs> Moochie. Moochie. All right. Yeah, I I very much like this, and I I think this is the bear saying. Uh, you said it a moment ago, fan service. This is not how fan service in the last several years has been given a really a, a stigma. This is not that kind of fan service. Mm, this is no, the kind of fan no. service that we saw in No Way Home. The really good fan service that actually isn't so much just saying, here's something for you. It's telling a story in such a way where it evokes the response that we call it fan service. Well, and, and, and like Rogue One. It's part of that yes. period piece business that Lucasfilm, I think, is excelling at in the post Disney era. Best not when all they of them. treat Star Wars like a period piece. Yes, but when they treat it like a period piece, and even Mandalorian is yeah. like that because they 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 still kind of rewind time in their heads and then play it forward slowly and reach a place that is yeah. still very familiar. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, the respect, the, the grace in which they do it, they don't always bonk you over the head, mm-hmm. which that a lot of fan services these days has become bonk you over the head with, with, hey, look at this. Hey, look at what we've done. 
Um, this is this this fan service is subtle. It is respectful. Um, th yeah, they absolutely are going. Hey, look what we've done! But they're doing it in a way that that makes a difference. And everything from the CRT monitors in Mandalorian that 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 look exactly like they did in the original trilogy to well, to what they've done here today with the Rancor. Yeah. John, you know the other piece and why the a lot of the modern fan services blink you over the head style mm -hmm. is it, it it breaks the fourth wall. Yep. It, it is not part of the scene other than to go, hi guys. Hey. We did guess a thing. What? Yeah. Yeah. No, right? I, I Whereas when we see this, it is always in keeping with the storytelling, right? In such a way that it totally fits. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it and and that actually reminds me of like the very first star wars and all the stuff that about the used universe and about not explaining things uh lucas's vision to tell a foreign language film in english like that to me it's all part of that kind of stuff it's very in keeping with the original trilogy it, it really I, does boil down to the fact that the creators and executive producers honestly you have to say they love star wars as much if not more than we do mm -hmm. and they just happen to be in a position where they can say, "Here's here's what we're going to do." It, don't get me wrong; these guys, these the, the 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 men and women who are doing this, they might as well be upstairs in their bedroom with their friends on the floor playing with figures because that's all they're doing. It's just that they're they've got a couple more dollars behind it to be able to do it with. Just a couple, and, and um, I have I a couple say... of other references in this episode to that that stuck <laughs> out to me. Um, I will say as a final thought on this section, and kind of overall, um, this just hit me as we're talking about this. The entire time she's walking in that section, I go, wow, they recreated the whole thing from Return of the Jedi. This is awesome. And then it just hit me. They're in the volume. Yep. Yes, they are. Which is crazy. <clears throat> so that's awesome. So uh, let's go to our next section. Section two. Uh, they go to visit the mayor. They approach the mayor with the <laughs> prisoner in tow. Uh, there are a ton of Trandoshans. I'm not sure if this was specific uh, based on the previous episode with that guy coming in, or they're just trying to say that a lot of the Trandoshans work for the mayor or, uh, or whatever. Um, then they meet a guy at the front desk who I'm calling Secretary Pedro Pascal because um, <laughs> he sure looks like him. Uh, the gentleman's name is actually Galen Howard, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, he tries to turn them away. Uh, they don't have an appointment. He makes a lot of excuses. He's interrupted by uh, the major domo. He is played by David Paschesi. He intervenes and mentions the lack of a litter again from last uh, last episode. He also tries to turn them away. Um, I kind of got the alarm of copious BS engaged right here. Uh, Boba Fett Here's that alarm as well, and his crew walks right past into the mayor's office slash throne room. Um, mayor Robert Rodriguez, apparently, <laughs> yep, uh, speaks with Boba Fett, has exchange about his status as Daimo. The mayor mentions that Nightwind are not allowed to operate out of Hutta and offer to pay the bounty, or out of Hut space, excuse me. Uh, one of his guards shoots the guy. He directs Boba to Dursa Flip's sanctuary. Um, Boba Fett states he will take the payment as the tribute the mayor should have come and brought originally. Um, they then go to Dursa Whips. They speak with her, and after Boba Fett um, cites that she is not acting normal, she explains that the twins have claimed Jabba's empire. We then get a drum beat, and then we'll move on to the next section once we're done discussing this interaction with the mayor and with Dursa Whip. Uh, so we will bounce first to you john and then we'll go to jay uh again great to go back into the cantina um seeing some of the characters again in there um the 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 the, the drum beat was <laughs> i i was literally oh 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 this is gonna be good <laughs> i know who this is gonna be <laughs> even saying the twins you know you didn't automatically have to assume that it was going to be hut twins but um, but it was, um, but you know, just it, it really interesting to see um, the president. Um, boy, I I can remember from being a very young boy that 
that figure who at the time was known as the hammerhead guy um that figure was always cool um i i, I part of me wants that to be the exact same person that we had seen mm -hmm. in in the cantina in the first movie um yeah uh, but you know that so interesting the political the, the the stuff going on in the background with the politics um i i thoroughly enjoyed it and uh I loved the line about um, family is 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 harder to handle than bounty hunting. You know, it, it really setting up the show for what it's what it's going to be about. It's not about bounty hunters. It is about a family that is formed in in this particular situation. Um, but yeah, it just just a really interesting um, setup to everything that's going to be happening going forward. All right, Jay, your thoughts. So, uh, first of all, I just have to mention the foreshadowing with the litter being brought back up again. Um, and the payoff, like, moments later. Like, yes. top-notch. Very, mm -hmm. like, oh, now, now we get it. Like, we sort of got it. Like, we could have it, a picture in our mind, but in a moment, we can really say, now we get it. Yeah. And we're going to. Um, a lovely piece of world building and we saw it in the trailers but i loved watching it actually in scene the mayor's uh translation device like yes, pay yes. close attention and he's speaking quietly from his two mouths and the Ithorians have those two side mouths right we've seen that in the animated works um how how that works we've seen them speak in the animated shows um and then this device instead of having the traipse around a protocol droid right does the translation out presumably he understands basic because it is the lingua franca of the galaxy what a nice little piece of world building again it's very star wars right got a problem there's some sort of star wars -y knick knack to take care of it um the power play john taught of politics the power play the word play between the mayor and boba fett um two things really st stood out to me. The, the mayor's use of naming to attempt to put Boba Fett in his place, um, I really felt it was partially successful, right? Uh, the, the power dynamics are not where Boba Fett wants them to be when he leaves that room. And the other thing uh, that I thought was interesting was how when the mayor said, go back over to uh, FWIP, right? It reminded me of in the Matrix, the Merovingian, right? You don't know what's going on here, mm. son, right? What, you just run along and try again because you are in over your head and don't actually understand why you are even here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Boba listens, like, in a way that it's like, I mean, yeah, he was given a clue, so he... I mean, it, like every good RPG, it's time to go off to the next NPC. And the other um, guy with the exclamation point. <laughs> right. Um, however, it was not a good move power-wise to yeah. simply go, all right, I'll go do that then, because he followed direction from the mayor who he's been trying to establish dominance over. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the scene with Flip is really very, it's just exposition. There's, I mean, yeah. it's nice that the casino is a nice set piece. I'm glad to see uh, Jennifer Beale's character back. I am curious to see if we will continue to see her. I like that character. Yeah, I think I like we have seen. Um, I think we've seen all the shots of her from the trailer already. Yeah, I think. I think even in the first episode, we might have. Like this, I think feels mm -hmm. new. No, there was one there was shot. One shot. Show. Was there yeah. one? Oh, okay. Where the Twilik walks but, up to her and she kind of looks around. Oh, you're right. Yep. Anyway, but I hope we get to see more of her. I like the Twi'leks. Uh, I like seeing another female Twi'lek in power, uh, like we saw Hera, but a very different style. <laughs> yeah. Right? This is a very yes. different woman of power, but still very much a woman of power. Yes. And I hope we get to see more of her. I do um, see that. Agreed. So yeah, that's that's what I think. Power, world um, building, and foreshadowing. I loved both of these distinct scenes. Um, just meeting all these characters and finally meeting the mayor. Um, I will say, based on the comments about family, um, in Legends, there were a lot of books written by Karen Travis, who dived into the Mandalorian culture. It was very different than it is presented at, by Disney, 
but there's a phrase in Mandalorian, Aliyet Orish Ya Talvin, family is more than bloodline, mm. which I think is super important. And I would love if they take that and tie that into the series because they've been cherry picking legend stuff. And that is really appropriate to this conversation. The family around you is more than those who are specifically related to you. They are your found and chosen families. And I think they already started to set that up mm-hmm. with the when Boba Fett shows his um, what are the 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 chain business his ID his ID card basically right. Yeah. I was um, going to say and, he's not technically Mandalorian, but they right, kind of but he but they they gave his father the armor in spite of the history and he still so he has it by rights but it's not by the same rights that like uh the gen or however you say his name would would claim it Dinjarin, yeah yep then john thank you what if we get to a point by the end of the series where he sands the green paint off and he's silver and blue again <laughs> <laughs> i think fans would probably riot or they'd love it i don't know all right so next section uh, the confrontation with the twins. So we hear the drum beat, we walk outside, and very slowly we hear that it has to be the strongest people in the galaxy uh, carrying two giant huts from around a building. They are the twins. I don't think we got their names at all. Um, Boba states he is Daimo now after killing Bid Fortuna, who usurped Jabba's territory. Um, they say... Basically, they say menacing things to him. And then the biggest, most badass looking Wookiee comes walking around from the litter. Boba says, uh, you can bring all the gladiators you want. It won't matter. Um, They say, basically, they make some empty threats uh, that aren't really empty because they're huts and they have power. Um, They leave after a few moments. Fennec states that they'll need permission to kill him. Uh, he says, maybe it's settled, as in the, the nature of leadership. She says, you really think so? He says, no. Now, there's a lot of things I glossed over here. Um, I'm going to start off this section because there's a comment that I want to talk about. Or not a comment. I want to comment on something. Um, did anyone else notice the hut doesn't eat the rat? He uses it as a brush. Yes. Isn't that the weirdest thing in the world? My first thought was, oh, he's he's getting a snack. The snacks were in the in the bowl on the other side. Yes. That is another way to show that the huts use everything to their pleasure. Yeah. He needs something to, to get rid of the, the perspiration. He needs something to get the dust off and the sand off of him. So what is he going to grab? He's going to grab a, a little... Oh. Very furry thing, which then bites him. And and get if you notice. Oh, I didn't notice that. Oh yeah, right at the didn't notice right, that. Oh, oh, it's great. He just it, he's sitting holding it, and you just see him go. Ah. <laughs> so my favorite part so, of this. So scene, real quick, so, so real quick, Chewie. I don't think that's the weirdest thing we saw, though. We just saw two huts cuddling. Twins. They were wrapped, siblings. Yeah, wrapped they, around sibling, each other. They were wrapped around each other. Their tails and are and are they were cuddling. They were cuddling huts. I didn't think huts could cuddle. And then on uh, top of that, they are twin siblings. You know, I will cuddling. say in legends, I don't know if this is canon anymore because I haven't read much about the huts in canon. I'm pretty sure the huts were hermaphroditic. They just reproduced asexually. So I don't know if they even have any like relations like that. So this could just be normal hut behavior, but whatever. And the, it was still weird. It was uh, still weird. Not, another thing to point out. We're going to talk about the sexual practices of that. <laughs> that's a different kind of video for the other side of YouTube. So also, I think worth noting, um, unless I'm mistaken, this is officially the the only the second and technically second and third huts that have ever been shown live action. They've had a lot of showings in the animated series. Yeah. But if you think about it, Jabba is yep. the only one who's ever been in, because even at yeah. the, the pod race, wasn't that supposed to be a young Jabba? It, is, yeah. it was, was. It was Jabba. Yep. So this is the first 
first time that you that you get to see the uh, the young huts, any huts other than that. And I like that they went with the uh, the tattoos, uh, which uh, or facial markings of some sort, which a lot yes. of the animated versions had. Um, but yeah, that that whole scene, that scene was was just a, a ton of fun and a, another fantastic. If you are the kind of, and for most people, they would never notice it. It just seems normal. Even for fans, it would have just seemed normal. But another perfect example of fan service is that when the huts started to speak, the font for the, for the, for the, for the captioning was the font used from Return of the Jedi every time Jabba spoke. I did not so notice it's, that. It's, it's, That's cool. Like they are using a unified font for hoodies. And and they continued a, a perfect example. I looked at it and was like, "Wait!" I, and I noticed it. A lot of people don't, but it just it just made it seem natural. It doesn't. It's not jarring, even if you don't get the fan service part of it. Maybe it's not din jarring. Ah, yeah, I'm a nerd. So um, yeah, no, I I like that too. I did not notice that at all. What I will say is, this is the scene I mentioned a moment ago. That Wookiee, Wookiees are my favorite species. And I'm sorry, that's because my nickname is Chewy, big and hairy and loud. <laughs> that was really cool. And it struck me, this is probably not, but could it be one we've seen before? We've seen Wookiees like at a Chiduk. We've Ooh. seen Tarful. Um, he looks a little angry, so I don't know if it's either of them, but Tarful was a, was a general warrior. He fought alongside Yoda. So I will say, I know, oh, sorry, if you were going to 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 jump in there, Jay. Uh, All please. good. Keep going. <laughs> you go ahead. Go ahead. I don't have any, any person, because I, I never read the comic series, but that, that particular, that particular character is apparently somebody that has a very long and storied history within the comics. Um, I have to look that up now. And apparently... Is I mean it, apparently the same character, same outfit. Um, awesome. uh, I I don't have enough details on it, but but yeah. So it's somebody that that's been lifted now, not from prior extended universe. Um, maybe he was in a novel somewhere along the line, but this is now something being pulled from comic uh, legacy um, and and being brought in as as now canon officially. I really like that character too. I hope do we get to see him again, Chewie. Um, yeah. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is his costume, right? If we look at many of the Wookiees in uh, in the classic trilogy or in the prequels, because that's where we really get to see most Wookiees, right, uh, established. Most of them don't wear much in the way of costume. The 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 species overlay is the actor's costume. That's basically it. They might have an accessory or two. This guy had a full-up costume, right? Um, and it reminded me a lot of the Star Wars RPGs, both the original Knights yes. of the Old Republic, right? There was a, a Wookiee there, Zoldar. right? And there is a Wookiee in uh, Star Wars, the Old Republic, the MMO, yes. as, one of the, um, as one of the companions. And both of them have much more complete costumes on top of being a Wookiee, right? And this is the first time I, that I can recall really seeing it. It's certainly brought to front and center for a live action Wookiee. And I really like that because it really, it's a very good piece of character building, right? This guy, yeah. like he's not hanging out on Kashyyyk and he's not hanging out on the Falcon, tinkering with things. Right, this guy, I, I, Gladiator, is the appropriate name, the title for him. Clearly, so I will say that I just did a. Quick I do have a name. That's where I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the reason why I like doing these with you guys. Is half the time we figure stuff out while we're recording, which is yeah. super awesome because I missed this. I didn't know this detail because I don't read the comics. Do share, please. Somebody, uh, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, um, he is an ex-gladiator, which explains the comment from Boba about a gladiator called, uh, he's a ex-gladiator turned mercenary black chrysanthemum, 
also known as Black K. Uh, Broad-shouldered Wookiee in obsidian fur and gold armor um, pulled directly. I mean, it's like the Doctor Afra comics. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. So that's so. This isn't like a Legends lift, even a comics no, Legends lift. This, this is, this a, is a this is Disney canon already, just crossing between media like Fennec has been. Yes. And uh, yeah, so in nice. fact, it's it's mentioned uh, that uh, you know having having the the Doctor involved, which again, not a character I hold, I know a whole lot about, mm -hmm. um, that this could be setting up for connections to uh, the Obi Wan series as well. Um, well, if so, I'm looking at the Wikipedia, um, and the entry in the very top, well, they've already changed this picture to it. If he's going to be anywhere, it's going to be there. Right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's uh, hey, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, it didn't even make that connection to you. just said it. It's the Wikipedia. Oh, Wikipedia, yeah. Well, wow. yeah. <laughs> so the quote at the top is a quote from Obi-Wan to him. So I would love to see this character show up in Obi-Wan. That's yeah. right, because apparently this character at some point... Um, worked for Jabba. Worked for Jabba, uh, tried to kidnap... Um, I'm guessing tried to kidnap Obi-Wan, but ended up kidnapping... Uh, um, uh, uh, Luke's uh, Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben. Yes, thank you. Um, and Uncle in Owen? the comic, in the comic series. So yeah. <laughs> Uncle Owen. Uncle Owen. Yeah. Oh, Uncle wow. Owen, not Ben. Sorry. We did mention Spider Man earlier, so we'll give you a pass. Thank you. I, cool. I yeah. So I'm excited. I hope we get to see him a lot. So I hope he is a reoccurring bad guy in these series. I was um, going to say, I cannot believe with the amount of screen time. I mean, granted, not a lot of screen time, but yeah. he got almost as much screen time as Boba Fett got in Empire Strikes Back. So that that should be a, a telling. So, so we'll expect a TV series in about 40 years. Yep. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, so the next section, um, we're actually going to jump back in time. So that section ends. He goes back to the back to the tank. Uh, there's a really cool uh, graphic when it intros the back in time. It looks like you're looking through one of the macro binoculars from um, Star Wars A New Hope. I think is really cool. Uh, you zoom in on Boba training with what I've called Michonne Tuscan, uh, training him on stick usage, and he starts to grow frustrated. This happens a couple of times. He trains a little bit more. Um, and then they hear the sound as a train passes. It kills uh, several Tuscans and a Bantha. Um, Boba is carrying one of the uh, Tuscans to the funeral pyre. They have a ceremony for the fallen Tuscans. In the darkness, Boba Fett sees a swoop gang that is the same swoop gang that he saw in the prior episode, um, terrorizing that uh, homestead and putting the symbol on the building. He gets an idea. He goes to the chieftain, tells him, I will take stick and gun and be back by morning with a way to stop the train. Boba Fett then goes in and goes Rambo on the swoop gang. And then Daisy chains all their bikes together and brings them back to the <laughs> Love tribe. that scene, by the way. <laughs> and then we have a wonderful training montage of teaching them to use the swoop bikes. Uh, we're going to go first to John. What are your thoughts on this whole section, John? Uh, there is nothing interesting there. I think we should go on. No, I'm kidding. I think you're right. So, Jay, what do you got for this? <laughs> now, I I love the training montage. Um, the humor, the, the way that they're able to just effortless, effortlessly, you know, they, they're te they're teaching the one Tuscan Raider to, to jump, um, jump over and... Uh, this is and Star he Wars falls, Frogger. And then the guy behind him just kind of goes, whoop. And I was <laughs> like, it's like that's, that's just too perfect. That's, that worked so well. That was a nice laugh moment for everybody. Um, it, yeah, it, it just really interesting where you can see um, from a mile away, no pun intended, you can see where this is going, that, yeah. that, that he is going to ingratiate himself so much with this tribe that um, he's going to become important to them and they're going to become important to him um, as time goes. And boy, what, what, a, fun, what a fun little section there. Uh, you, you're rooting all of a sudden. Just the amount of work that they've done between, what, a couple of episodes of Mandalorian and now uh, one episode of Book of Boba Fett, well, two, two episodes of Book of Boba Fett, the amount of, of um, um, just 
culture um, and, and world building of the Tusken Raiders is, is so perfect. Um, they really, uh, this is a race now that everybody actually cares about. Everybody yep. wants, wants to know a little bit more about them. And all of a sudden they start making a lot more sense. Yeah. Jay, what you got? So uh, a few things. One, I want us to, this is one of those things we can claim credit on. Last week, we talked about how cool would it be that as he starts to understand their language, right? If we would start to get subtitles to the degree to which he understands. And here we are. Yep. They, he, he is mostly yep. communicating to them through the same sign language that Din Djarin was using in uh, season one of Mandalorian, right? Uh, and we see the translations, right? And he speaks it out loud for us when he's talking right so put some points on our board guys that was cool nerd talk one disney zero that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um another thing um uh i i love that the, the the whole train bit like as the the thing we're gonna have to deal with is reminiscent of the sand crawler episode in mandalorian yes right where when when he goes and climbs on it and gets thrown off, right, and all. Um, I also like how uh, this is a, a a repulsor lift train that needs no tracks. Yeah. And that the sign language for it in Tuscan is long speeder. Someone give me a cat meme, but with the, the train, long speeder is long. Um, and then one final comment to wrap up that uh, which is actually about everything in the rest of the episode because we stay in this time frame for the rest yes. of the episode. And I, uh, I want to give credit where credit is due as reading some of the Reddit discussions on the episode early this morning uh, after I watched this at <clears throat> 3 a.m. my time. Don't ask. Just don't ask. I did, though. Yeah. Um, was the flashbacks, right? These are This is within some short period of time post-Jedi. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And everything else that we've been seeing in the Mandoverse, if you will, right, is five, five and a half, maybe cre maybe creeping in towards nearly six years post Jedi, right? Or, Which means or thirty years prior. Well, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, we do have some flashbacks all the way back to the Clone Wars, right? But predominantly, someone pointed out on Reddit, and I thought it was really a clever comment. What's about to come, and we'll, we'll hit it, like, with the, with the Tuscans dealing with the train, right, explains a lot about why Din Djarin had to hand over the macro binoculars in season one to pass through their territory. Mm. Oh, yeah. this predates that moment by about yeah. five years. There's a toll now. Yes, that's cool. Right. Oh man, I did not. Make I, I, I didn't either, and I just thought it was absolutely brilliant to point out. It's, it's really fun to to see a later series fill in the gaps of before the series you've already watched. Sure, uh, yeah. and this is this is high John Favreau and Dave Filoni storytelling. Uh, at its best, and uh, so I just whoever that redditor was, wow! You it, like you really opened my eyes, and I'm glad to get a chance to share it on video. I dig it. Uh, so my comments on this section are very brief. Um, I the first Star Wars game I ever played was Shadows of the Empire on Nintendo 64, and mm. my favorite level was the Swoop Chase. So I love, I love. It's just like a biker gang. I loved it. <laughs> it's like, um, what's that uh, Orange County or whatever it is? That bike Orange show? Orange County Choppers? That. It's like that meets Star Wars. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are two music cues in this section. One, when the door opens and all you see is the outline of Boba Fett, it just cuts into that low drum beat that's super menacing. And then the building triumphant music when he's rolling in with the bikes. That's got to be Boba Fett's theme from now on because it's so good. By the way, I loved it. If I, if I and I, I I apologize if I'm interrupting. This was the other real deep cut fan service that again most people are not going to catch. So when he goes and 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 gets to the bikers, do you know where he is? 
Tashi Station. He's at Tashi Station, and it is a it is a <laughs> it is a complete rebuilt replica that was used in a deleted scene from A New Hope, where Luke runs into Tashi Station. The door is the same. There is a a circular panel with buttons on it on the wall that is identical. And if you were to go back and look at that clip, there are two people that look exactly like the two humans. I mean, exactly, I was why except we for the this... fact that they look slightly older, but oh, yeah. it, they they look exactly and it and it was and I don't know the the character names, but they are friends of Luke's, and it was the two of them and Luke and then Luke's cousin uh, Biggs. And so they show the interior of, of this Tashi station bar, and then they go outside. Um, and that was the introduction to Biggs that ended up being cut out of the movie. But oh yeah, this is this is the exact same room, the exact same setup. That's cool. Um, with the same people sitting in the bar still all these years later. That's awesome. Um, I did not realize I've never seen that deleted scene. So mm. I'm missing out. So let's. Check oh, you should on. go watch it. It's it's on YouTube all over the place. Cool, especially uh, now. Like the algorithm will throw it up for you now. Oh yeah, you're right. Um, let's uh, let's jump on to the next section. Um, so Boba Fett has finished his training. Uh, he saddles up with his posse and develops a plan to take out the train. Um, they attack the train. Um, they use some grappling hooks to climb on. A couple of them are taken out in the process. Uh, I believe this is the Pike Syndicate. Um, yes, based on I, the think, I think heads, so. The species, yeah, I, I believe so. it's the Pikes. Um, I think you're right. Several of them get on top. They start fighting their way forward. Um, Michonne Tuscan then comes up and dives through a window. And that apparently is Michonne because she just badasses her way through the train, pops up <laughs> um, in a very comical moment, looks around, wow drops again and people just start getting sucked out through holes because she's pulling them down and killing them. Um, Boba fights his way to the front of the train. The droid kind of says, nope, I'm good, and jumps out the window. Creepy droid, by the way. Um, he's able to stop the train. It crashes. They gather the crew that was on the train. The um, folks have a confrontation with them. Boba asks the pike leader, do you are you shipping spice? He basically says, I don't know what spice look like. One of the Tuscan Raiders in the background drop a crate, it opens up and does just like it did in Legends. When it hits the light, it sparkles. Yeah. He says, like that. That. Um, he then says there will now be a toll for passing through the Dune Sea. He gives them each, I don't know what he called it, a watermelon. That's, he did not call it a watermelon. No, there's oh, a black the, water the black melon. A the black, black melon. melon. Black. Um and sends them toward Anchorhead. Um, Jay, go ahead and give me your top-down thoughts on this section. Uh, yeah, I mean, who doesn't love a good train heist story? You know, sequence. Apparently, every movie company in the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the I, I I really appreciated that it doesn't go perfectly according to plan. Yes. There's some lovely beats in the conflict right from a storytelling you know directing standpoint there are lovely beats and reversals and i love when boba fett has to finally like his speeder his speeder gets hit but it it doesn't explode right away he he grabs one of the tuscans right and they hop off of it just in time and there's a spectrum um I also, so just some really lovely beats, and you talked about all the yeeting beats, right? The, that one Tuscan just going wild, like awesome. And she, then she needs a name. <laughs> she does. She does. And, and every, Most, every couple of the seconds Tuscans you're seeing, whoop, whoop, yep. whoop. <laughs> and then, yeah, you're, you're spot on, like the one time popping up and seeing what, like, getting situational awareness and going, oh, there's more back over there. Um, <laughs> and then they get yeeted, right? Gone. Um, all the Tuscans at this point need names. I think you're spot on earlier, John, that we have moved past Anakin's and um, and Owen's father and even uh, and Owen's Obi view of even Obi-Wan's view to a certain degree. These are people, yeah. which is really 
like I usually think of Star Trek being the series, the universe that brings me the humanization of the other. Mm -hmm. um, and like props to Favreau, Filoni and everyone working Boba Fett for bringing the Tusken Raiders a touch of humanity to a point where we're like, they all bloody need names. And then the other thing is we get foreshadowing after the fact, like it's earlier in his history, but after the fact of what we've already seen it. So after shadowing um, of the uh, respect versus fear business, right? And that there is something that we were not aware of, I think, in Boba Fett's fundamental makeup. And I now kind of want to go back and rewatch some of the Clone Wars episodes with him to see if I can find a hint of this in Filoni's writing of him. Um, that needs us, that has a really strong sense of fairness, of justice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, our original vision of Boba Fett is just badass bounty hunter. Right. And just the most baddest ass of all bounty hunters. He gets it like if he's after you, you might as well just stop and turn yourself in because it's that's the ending yeah, that's yeah. going to happen. Right. Period. Um, but never any motivation. He just that's just his skill level. That's all we knew of him. Right. But the more we get into this series and and actually even we saw in Mandalorian with the business right about. No, 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 that armor is mine by rights and I just want what's fair, right? I'm just, I will stick around with you because it's fair, because it's right. He has, there's a deep sense of, uh, of, of fairness in him that we didn't see before. Uh, and this is the kind of earlier hint of it. And it, you know, fast forward back to the present and it's why he is wanting to rule through uh, through respect instead of fear, even as Fennec points out, fear is faster. And you know, I gotta agree with you. Um, the show would have would have done well if it was if it was two dimensional. He's a bounty hunter, just doing a bounty every week or whatever. The fact that they've gone back and and this is I I gotta think this this is Favreau and Filoni. And not to overuse the, the the concept, but they're they're ten years old, sitting up on their their bedroom floor, playing with their figures. Because if you mentioned making, you, you you went back and talked about making making us care about them, and now making you care about what Boba Fett's doing and wanting to go back to see Filoni's writing on that. Well, if you think about it, Filoni has done that now with the Mandalorian as a whole, as a culture. They've he's now done this with he and Favreau have done this now with with the Tuscan Raiders as a culture. He, he's they're in the process of doing it right now with Boba Fett. He yeah. is not at all. There are so many layers here, and that's the excellent part of storytelling. Yes, that is I think part of what's making this a successful show. I agree. Just like the Mandalorian so, has become us, it was such a successful show. There's so many layers. Yes. Yep. So let's go ahead and move to our final section. Um, the chieftain tells Boba he has a gift for him, which is apparently a cocaine lizard. So he snorts the lizard, or rather the lizard snorts him. And, and I... <laughs> this I'm sorry, sequence. I just, I'm like, I, 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 have to, I have to have a moment to just appreciate the absurdity. You know, it's, years ago we had the hammerhead figure, and now from this point forward, we're going to have the cocaine lizard. I it, it's gonna be I don't know how else to describe that thing. I mean, it's of but all you the tell things that, I thought uh, it was gonna do. I thought this was gonna be I, let me be honest, I thought this was a baby of the thing Obi-Wan wrote in, in return of the Revenge oh. of the Sith. And I was like, oh, that's gonna have a mount. And then the thing jumps up his nose. I'm like, what is happening right now? It was so. I weird. think you've forgotten the peyote component of it. Like it's it's yes. entry via cocaine, but its effects are so it, very peyote. much so. So and Boba this, Fett this... has, um, a Boba Fett has a vision experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm ultimately not sure what was happening, but he finds a tree in an ocean, um, and then comes back the next morning with a stick. I don't know if he actually found a tree or this is driftwood or what. Uh, maybe you guys could shed some light on exactly what happened. I watched it three times. That section, I couldn't follow it. 
Um, but the chieftain then <laughs> withdraws the cocaine lizard, which seemed fun. And he mentions that he thought that was part of the vision too, uh, which it was not. <laughs> um, they then have this wonderful scene where they dress him in the garments of the tribe. So he's now part of the tribe. He's then allowed to craft his own gaffy stick from the piece of wood, which he then brings back to present to the chieftain and the tribe for approval from the tribe. They, Boba and Michonne, Michonne Tuscan, then begin to dance and the tribe slowly joins in. Um, I don't know if you guys caught this. I know it's not perfectly like it, but it very much struck me as a haka with them dancing together in such a way. It was lacking the, the, the self um, claps or the tongue, but it felt like that with the intensity on Tamara's face, especially with him being from New Zealand and having done this a couple of times. Um, I was going to say between that and the um, the very very obvious um, you know comparison to Native American culture, many of the Native American with the way they handled so many of the different aspects of that evening, yes. and then you know and then did the the, the the dance around the fire. Oh, I think we're losing a bit, John. Whoops, sorry. I'm here. I promise I really am. Uh, what kind of thoughts you got, Jay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Continue and I'll, I'll play along. So, I, it, fair enough. Um, this is, this whole sequence from, from the lizard's appearance to the fire at the end, yes. right, is clearly the coming of age ceremony for warriors in the tribe. So what we have is a, a, a grown foreigner, right? Having spent all the episode learning the ways of the tribe, mm -hmm. coming to care for the tribe and demonstrating his commitment to the tribe, right? And the end result being uh, a very, very meaningful, like, this is not when the Ewoks say, we're a part of the tribe, right? This is, no, really, you are going to go do what every one of our young warriors does as a final test for acceptance into warriorhood in the tribe. Yeah. Um, the, my take on the vision quest, because there's no, like, that was a vision quest. It was an, indu it was a, an induced vision quest, which is very in keeping, right, with tribal customs, right, is that the tree was real. Mm -hmm. um he didn't have to wrestle the tree but in his vision induced interaction with the tree it felt to him his experience was he was wrestling with it and he was just pulling a, a branch off right um and the ocean bit was the vision quest reflection of the earlier commentary about before the oceans dried up right and all that kind of came into his head. And it probably, it probably often comes into most of the warriors' heads. Like that is probably very similar experiences to probably what a lot of them, because I don't think they would have brought the ocean up randomly, I right? I think this is part of moving him in the direction of trust and preparation for the ceremony. You have to remember, he may not know what the hell's going on, but the, tr the chief does, Yes. right? As, as, as these steps start, you know, progressing and we get closer to that moment with the lizard, the chief knows what's going on. And he is directing people to move it in the direction in this direction, to this path, and waiting to see if Fett continues to follow the path that's laid out before him. So I thought it was beautiful. I white guy, so what do I know about its ref actual reflection on on tribal cultures? Uh, I would be very interested to, to go find some commentary from uh, from a variety of, of cultures that are closer to what was being reflected to see mm -hmm. if that was a fair and honest representation. Because let's face it, the you know John Favreau, another white guy. Yep. Um, so <laughs> I don't know, but I I mean from where I can sit and see with my limited vantage point. I thought that sequence was beautiful. I love the, just the whole thing, like from the, the dressing piece, especially on towards the end. Like, I, yeah, I was really blown away by that part. 
Gotcha. Awesome. Well, I know you have I'm any... back here, by the way. So <laughs> just in case you need it. Um, I do you have any quick final thoughts on the episode as a whole uh, before we roll out? If I could throw in just a couple of quick things, since I kind of missed a little bit of that last section. Um, first off, uh, Tamara Morrison has obviously taken a couple of COVID tests. Will you see that reaction when the when the when the thing goes up his nose? It's I mean it's it's clear that that's that was you know I don't know I, I wouldn't call it method, method acting, acting but hey, yeah hey, I think I, I, we'll give it method we'll call it method acting the, the cocaine COVID lizard the, that's right. <laughs> But man, that what, you know, mirroring a lot of what he said, um, it, just an incredible thing. I, again, I never had thought in a million years that somebody would make me fascinated at the construction of a band, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, gappy, gappy stick. stick. But holy moly, I was sitting there watching that, not even blinking. I was so curious and and interest, I was like, wait a minute, it's not wood, it's metal. Oh, wait, they are putting the metal on top of the wood. And, and oh my goodness, it, that just, that blew me away. I, yeah. that was such a beautifully shot little scenario. But um, the, a lot of stuff with that, with that vision that he had, um, if you, if you noticed, you know, he looks at his helmet and sees the reflection of himself mm-hmm. or maybe the reflection of his dad, because you don't know since they are the same. Um, but it reminded me of the shot uh, in Dagobah when when um, <sighs> when Luke looks down into the Vader mask and sees his own face dead. Same thing here. Wow. Also, when he is fighting the tree, I swear those little eyes that look like um, the little points of light all over the tree look just like Jawa eyes. And I thought back yes. to the fact that the Jawas had stolen his his uh his um all of his uh, uh armor at the very <laughs> at the very beginning flashback. I literally was like, oh he done got high and he's gonna go murder Jawas. <laughs> 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 Wouldn't be the first guy, I'm pretty sure. But uh, no fairly sure. I just again that it, it, that was one of those you have to go back and watch it a couple of times to catch everything. But boy, um, interesting connection with the beginning of the episode showing the, the young um, uh, Boba Fett going and looking at the window as his dad's flying off in the, in the, in the um, in, well, okay, at the time we were calling it Slave One, whatever its official name is now. Um, but I am not aware of anything that has actually changed the name in canon. Uh, yeah. The Lego set is dropped the, t- the name probably because it's a child's toy. But I've not seen anything else anywhere, anywhere that that's, that's that, done that, including StarWars.com. I will their say, data bank entry is still Slave One. I, I will say, and this is something uh, my uncle actually brought up. He's a super Star Wars fan. Um, a long time ago, it's called Slave One. So, wouldn't there be multiple versions of this vehicle? Could be. It's very much like Star Trek Enterprise well, D. And the thing from yep. the beginning of the episode that I found a little odd that, that kind of connects in with this is, you know, my first thought was, oh, maybe that was when his father was going to Geonosis and, and but no, because yeah. Boba was with him. He wouldn't have stayed behind. Oh, I, I actually thought it was the run into Coruscant. Oh, uh, you know what? And that's probably, oh, yeah. probably what it was, but time yeah. to go assassinate oh. a, a, a former queen. Mm-hmm. all right guys so we're almost at an hour um yes. at this point just give me your top final thoughts on the episode as a whole uh john um uh, very very solid episode F- a couple of fun little little things that pop up um but you know not anything earth shattering but boy this really it really stepped up the uh the lore and um and the uh the the exposition going on and just a solid story that that's being created here from from this three ish is it wednesday yet <laughs> well, that, it, that's be, my takeaway is it wednesday yet it'll be pretty close by the time we get to this air so <laughs> all right well that is that is our spoiler review of the book of Boba Fett episode two tribes of tatooine uh, i hope you've enjoyed this john tell them what they can look forward to and look for on the channel 
Well, um, certainly if you uh, haven't had a chance to go back and watch our first episode uh, roundup from this uh from this series from Book of Boba Fett. We have some other things from Marvel Universe. Uh, we're gonna have uh, some more Star Trek comment, content coming in. We're gonna have some retro content coming in with with my, uh, with my John's Vault and um, a lot more to look forward to. Make sure uh, that you check out the, the, the uh, not only our Facebook page, but also the YouTube page. Uh, like and subscribe to all of that. Um, it's an ethical way to hack YouTube's algorithm and make sure uh, that we uh, that we get some numbers and and get some support. Yeah. All right. Well, I you can find me at the Jake the Nerd on Twitter and Instagram. You can find John at the John the Nerd on Twitter. And this is the Jay Simmons. That was a point down, not at me. <laughs> this is the the singular Jay Simmons here joining us for the entirety of our Book of Boba Fett run and our Picard runs when that comes. Um, other than that, you all have a great evening. Please join us for the episode three, whatever that remains to be seen as a title. Uh, and we'll see you right back here on Nerd Talk with Jake and John. I am Jake. I'm John. And we'll see you next week. Have fun. Be safe. <laughs>